When 802.11 wireless networks started to become very popular, one of the biggest challenges we had was how are we going to protect this data that's going through the air that anybody would be able to listen to, grab onto, and view on their computer. This is what the bad guys do, is they get a protocol analyzer. They begin listening to the air around them. And any packets flying by, they simply grab those and put it into the buffer. And at that point, they're able to start working with that data, manipulating it, looking at the information. If it's in the clear, they can see everything. If it's encrypted data, they have to do a little bit of extra work to try to decrypt that data and see what's inside of that. In 802.11 web, there's this concept of an initialization value. This IV is a bit of data that's put onto the packet itself along with the key to create effectively a key that would ideally keep changing all the time. So it was your static key along with an IV value associated with it. Another aspect of 802.11 WEP is that we would send all of the encrypted data along to the other side, but we would also include in the clear the plain text initialization value. That's because once it got to the other side, that device needed to know the IV so that it could decrypt all of that data. Well, that was a bit of a problem. That created some challenges, as you're about to find out. One of the issues with 802.11 WEP was that the key strength was not very big. The key itself was limited to a 64-bit size. Once you put in all the information that you had for the key, it could not exceed 64 bits. And that was something that was required by the US government. They wanted to keep that small so that they could ultimately decrypt that information. Later on, that key size was increased to 128 bits. But at the current time when it was implemented, 64 bits was all you had. But of course, the 64 bits was including your key and the initialization value. So what we ended up having was a 40-bit key and a 24-bit initialization value to make up those 64 bits. Well, that's not a lot of bits. And the problem was that now we had a lot of the key that was being sent along with the plain text data onto the other side. Let's see how this works. This is the process for encrypting data and sending it to another station with 802.11 WEP. Now, obviously, you're going to start with what we call the plain text. This is the information that we want to be able to encrypt. Along with the plain text, we're going to calculate a cyclical redundancy check. This is a CRC. On the other side, we'll use that CRC to make sure that the original plain text arrived without any type of corruption or any changes in between. So those two things together make up that plain text in CRC. Now you need to encrypt it. So of course, you're going to have a key. You will configure a wireless key for your access point, and there is our initialization vector. Notice these are not to scale. Obviously, your key is 40 bits, and the initialization vector is 24 bits in that initial 802.11 WEP. That value is put together, and then it is ciphered with an RC4 cipher. So it's effectively encrypted itself, which is our final key. That is our key stream. All of that information together now will be combined with the plain text in CRC in an XOR fashion to come up with the final cipher text that we will use. And that's what's sent to the other side. Notice that the initialization value, the original value before we encrypted anything, is also included with the cipher text that we send to the other side. That's because that remote station needs to decrypt this information. And that initialization vector is the only thing that is different that it needs to know about. It has to know the IV so it can reverse this process on the other side. With web encryption, everybody has the same key. And that's the key value that is used when sending that information across the network. This is a little bit challenging, of course, because if somebody leaves the organization, they're taking the key with them. They know the key. You now have to change everybody else and make sure they're using a different key on your network. A little bit more of a challenge to handle the management of your encryption when everybody is using exactly the same key. It also makes it easier for someone to try to decrypt this data. And that was one of the big problems with 802.11 web. The initialization vector is 24 bits long. And that's not a lot. That's the only thing we have to help randomize this data that we're sending to the other side. If you do the math for that RC4 cipher stream, you have finally a web key that can be one of 16,777,216 possible iterations. That's not a lot in the big scheme. And of course, those initialization values can also be reused 
as this traffic is going across your network. This for a person who is trying to do decryption is fantastic. But for those of us that want to keep our data private, this isn't so much of a good thing. You also have the challenge in 802.11 WEP that some of these initialization values don't provide very good security. Some of the IVs have been found to be weak. They don't provide as good as an encryption as other initialization values might. Now, one of the things that the manufacturers did later on was not to use those particular initialization values. But at the very beginning, we were using all of them. Nobody knew that a lot of these cryptographic problems existed. And that made it that much easier to discover what the wireless key happened to be. Another thing that the bad guys would do is they would put their own frames onto the network in an effort to increase the number of initialization values that were being used. The more IVs that were going across the network, the easier it was for them to begin decrypting this information. And these days, you can plug in a connection, listen to a web network, and really in a matter of minutes, you'll be able to tell what the encryption key is for the entire web network. And then you're able to see everybody's information all in plain text, you're able to decrypt everything going over that network. Now, obviously, that's not what we wanted from wireless security. That's why we say these days, don't use WEP. That's not a good idea at all. What you'd like to use today is WPA. But obviously, there are security concerns when you're working with WPA. And when you may be worried that the bad guys might be able to get into a WPA network. And it is possible for the bad guys to do that. Let's find out how. One of the great things about WPA is the cryptography inside of the encryption mechanism is much more advanced and much more secure than our web networks were. So that's a good part is that there's no real known vulnerabilities associated with WPA, at least not any significant enough to really be a problem for our production networks. If you're in a medium to large size organization, you're probably integrating your WPA connection with 802.1x. So you're using your normal enterprise login to get to the wireless network, the same one you use to log into your desktop, for example. One of the nice things about this is that it has a setup and a configuration inside of it that will constantly change these keys throughout the life of those sessions. So you can feel pretty sure that the WPA2 enterprise connection is going to maintain privacy of your data. If you're in a small office or you're using your wireless network at home, you may be using WPA2, but it's in a personal mode. It uses something called a PSK. It stands for pre-shared key. You put the same key on everybody's machine, and they're able to gain access to the wireless network. Although there are no cryptographic problems with WPA2, nobody can come onto your network and in a few minutes gain the key like they did with WEP. One of the problems you have is anything that uses a pre-shared password or passphrase can be broken using a brute force attack. You can also use something called a dictionary attack to do this. So instead of the bad guys trying to figure out from your encrypted data what your key is, they'll simply try every possible key they can think of. They'll try the word Apple. They'll try the word home. They'll try the word address. They'll try anything in their dictionary hoping that they're going to hit on whatever that pre-shared key was that you came up to begin with. So they could spend hours, in some cases even days, trying to figure out what that pre-shared key is. If you're setting up your wireless network, you want your pre-shared key to be something you can't find in a dictionary. You don't want it to be a word at all. You want it to be a random amount of data. You want it to have a lot of entropy, as we call it in computing. We want there to be complete randomization, uppercase characters, lowercase characters. We want to perhaps put special characters inside of it. The more we can make it complex and the longer we can make that key, the harder it's going to be for the bad guys to use their brute force attacks or their dictionary attacks to somehow reverse engineer what this happens to be. Hopefully you can see now why we say make sure you're using WPA and not that older WEP encryption. It is so easy for someone to gain access into a WEP encrypted network. You want to use WPA, and you want to be sure that your WPA passphrases are as long and secure as possible.